Good evening, fellow National Black MBA Association members and any guests that are joining us here today. Happy Conference 2020. This year is monumental for us because as an association, we're celebrating 50 years. Big congrats to everyone on this outstanding accomplishment. 50 years long, 50 years strong. My name is Lamar White and I proudly serve as the president of the National Black MBA Association, Inc., Washington, D.C. chapter. We're the second largest chapter in the association with over 1,400 members representing D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, known as the DMV. We're also one of the oldest chapters at 38 years old and we'll be celebrating 40 years of existence in 2022. I do want to give a big shout out to my fellow board members before we get started with today's program. And they are Latrice LeBlanc, Maima Richards, Yasmin Sabu, Carletta Hurt, Rodney Norwood, Jamie Richardson, James Harrington Jr., Cornelius Henderson, Fran Hall, Linda McLeod, Volker Norwood, and Kwame Sapran. I'd also like to give a big shout out to all the past presidents and past board members of the DC chapter. Thank you to all our lifetime members for your continued support and a huge shout out to one of the founding members of the National Black MBA Association, who's also a member of our chapter, Karen Williamson, who was also our 2019 Legacy Award winner. I'd also like to recognize at this time our sister chapter, the Northern Virginia chapter. Okay. Now, I know that you're not here just to hear me talk, so let's jump right into this evening's program. Cocktails, cooking, and conversations. And this evening, we have some amazing and talented guests that are making headlines in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area, and also nationally. And we're thrilled to be able to showcase their talents here at our 2020 conference and career fair, a virtual experience. Our first guest this evening is one of DC's most popular beverage and spirit connoisseurs and an amazing mixologist. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Andrew Johnson, known as AJ. Now, AJ, before we get into mixing the official cocktail of Conference 2020, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, AJ? Oh, a little bit about me. Um, so currently, I am the managing partner and uh, beverage director uh, at Serenata and Zumo, located in the new Laco Secha Latin Market here in the Union Market District. Uh, we actually are coming up on one year being open, uh, which obviously through this COVID time um, is a big accomplishment um, for us, but staying open a year um, is a big accomplishment for any business. Um, I personally have been in the restaurant industry for going on 19 years now. Um, I've done everything under the sun, uh, managing, bar direction, ownership, flexing, hosting, dishwashing, everything. Uh, but I really did sort of find my place behind the bar. Um, and with that, um, I started to see that there weren't a whole lot of people behind the bar uh, in the places that I was working in uh, that looked like myself. Um, and so it became very apparent to me that I needed to branch out a little bit and use my talents uh, in order to be able to, to create platforms for other young uh, black hospitality professionals as well. And so I have sort of turned my skills behind the bar and in management towards uh, programming such as DMV Black Restaurant Week, which we are in our third year. Uh, the next one is coming up in this November. Uh, and also with my cocktail pop-up, uh, Back to Black Cocktail Pop-Up, uh, we're having November 7th and 8th this year. We have raised already over $20,000 in two pop-ups. So it has been um, a whirlwind of, uh, of a year, but definitely seeing that there's this need for, um, for our stories and our faces and our representation to be out there. Um, and so that's a, that's a little bit about me kind of in a nutshell. Um, I know that everybody's probably a little thirsty <laughs> but it is happy hour, right? It's five o'clock before, somewhere. Before we actually jump into mixing the drink, and I'm going to be mixing along with you this evening, but I had a few more questions for you, AJ. Yeah. Um, my first question is, there is no limit to the choices on the market for bourbons. 
Um, and as you can see here this evening, my the one I'm gonna be using is Woodford Reserve. What is your favorite or what would you recommend and why? I think my favorite bourbon, especially from a cocktail mixing standpoint and from a price uh, standpoint is gonna be either Johnny Drum 101 or Traverse City out of Michigan. Um, okay. Everybody thinks that bourbon has to come from Kentucky and that is a very, very false narrative. Um, great marketing, but it is not, um, it is not true. You I'm guilty not, of that. It doesn't have to come from, oh, did you not hear that? No, I said I'm guilty of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's a, a it's great marketing though, right? Um, yeah, but Kentucky is, it can, you know, it's known as the home, but it's actually not, um, coincidentally the home of bourbon making and things like that, um, is actually Maryland and Pennsylvania. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so it definitely started around this area, not down uh, in Kentucky. Uh, so I definitely say Traverse City, Johnny, Johnny Drum 101 are my go-to cocktailing bourbons. Gotcha. I'll definitely take a note of those and try them later. Another question for you. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on clear versus dark liquors? So for example, I tend to go with clear liquors such as gin during the uh, warmer months, like the summer, and I lean towards darker liquors like your rums and your bourbons during the colder months. Is there any type of art or science that we should know around this or is it just whatever you like? No, I think, again, I think it has a little bit more to do with marketing. Um, I think it is a preference standpoint as well. I am a bourbon drinker uh, by choice or a whiskey drinker by choice, I should say. I have a tattoo that says, if the ocean was whiskey and I was a duck, I'd dive to the bottom and never come up. But that also means that in the summertime, it's really hard to go out and find cocktails that have bourbon in it um, that don't kind of feel heavy and weighty. Um, and so my job has been super fun here at Serenata because I've been able to take the tropical programming that we do from a menu standpoint and, in, and impart all those type of flavors with different spirits that I love, right? So I have a drink on right now called Paradise City, and it's essentially a daiquiri, but with bourbon. I take a little bit of coconut, hibiscus, right, a little bit of uh, honey, lime, velvet falernum, and instead of rum, we're using bourbon. And those flavors impart the same way. Essentially, wherever you see an aged rum, you can always impart flavors of bourbon. And so I've been able to sort of figure out how to drink my bourbon and get my brown spirits in in the spring and the summertime. Uh, but really, honestly, I mean, when it comes to drinking, you drink what you like. There is no right or wrong. Um, like how we say with wine, there's a, you know, you drink white with uh, fish and you drink red with meats. Yep. You drink what you want with what you like. And yes, there are flavor profiles we should stick towards. But at the end of the day, what tastes best to you and what is the best thing to drink is going to be what you enjoy the most. Gotcha. And now, AJ, you're mixing up exciting cocktails, but you're also causing quite the stir in the DMV community. And that's a positive stir. You talked a little bit earlier about Back to Black Cocktail Pop-Up, which is an initiative that leads to money being donated, I believe, to local charity. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that initiative? Yes, for sure. Um, so uh, obviously around the time where um, the news is breaking about Amon Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, us in the bar industry, a lot of people were also being laid off. Um, so we weren't being able to get behind our bars. The only thing that we really felt like we could be connected to was the movement. Now, for those of us that were able to stay in our spaces, um, we were hit with a dilemma. A global pandemic, go down, march with everybody, risk getting sick, um, but knowing that that's the right thing to do, or being inside of our job, trying to keep our businesses afloat. And for me, I had to pick between the two. Um, and I felt that that wasn't fair. And at, at some points I felt a little helpless. Um, I got a phone call from a friend and she said, look, somebody like you's gotta go out and do something. Uh, and so I did, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that it would be as big as it got. I just knew that I had to do something and I knew that I was capable of it because I was still in my space. I have access to, to booze, I have access to food, I have access to toiletries, things like that, that could go out and help people. Um, and I called up a few friends and said, hey, I want to do this thing and we're going to we're gonna make cocktails because this is what we do right. and we're going to go out and help people. And so there were four storytellers, myself included, uh, and we also had a chef, uh, Paolo Velez was our chef. Um, and we all created items 
and told our stories that were sold with the items, um, personal stories of our experiences of being black, not only in this country, but also in this industry. Um, and each of us also chose a charity to donate to. Um, and so that first pop-up, we ended up raising a little under $11,000, a little, a little over $11,000. And then we decided to do it again, um, but instead of having the original organizers uh, do the pop-up, we actually brought in four more bartenders and one more chef. And so now we're on our third iteration that'll be in November, and we are actually, as we speak, we're tasting their cocktails and gonna be uh, starting to bash those up shortly as well. So I'm super excited about what's to come for that. Um, and hopefully, you know, by the end of the year, the goal is that we really can get around $40,000 raised. At this point, it would be for 28 organizations. Wonderful, that is amazing that you're out in the community using your talents to benefit people, especially during these very challenging times. So we, we definitely appreciate all that you're doing there. Uh, but with that, we're here for you to mix up the official cocktail of Conference 2020. Am I pronouncing it right? It's called the Valkyrie? Valkyrie. Valkyrie, okay. Valkyrie. All right. Yeah. Um, um, so over to you. I am going to be following along. I'm going to mix up the Valkyrie here in my kitchen. Um, stage is yours. You got it. Thank you, baby, so much. Um, so the Valkyrie. Um, a Valkyrie is somewhat of a prodigy, right? Um, they exude excellence and proficiency in their trade. Um, and I thought it was so very fitting that this being the National uh, Black MBA Association with all of you all showing your excellence and your proficiency in your trade that this be the cocktail um, of the conference, right? Um, so it is essentially a riff on a Black Manhattan, uh, which is one of my favorite cocktails, right? We know the classic Manhattan being two ounces of your bourbon or your rye spirit, sweet vermouth, Angostura bitters. Stirred up, cherry, done, right? With the black yes. and you have a little bit more texture, right? You have richness. Obviously, you're imparting a little bit more color in there because if I do say so, every space that we're in deserves a little bit more color, okay? Um, and you have to impart a little bit more spice there as well. Now, I'm gonna kick up the sweetness here so that you have your choice of either the apricot or the peach liqueur, okay? Um, and that's really to sort of cut the note of the spice, but also to play off the stone fruits from your bourbon. So before we get started, let's make sure we have our tools ready. You need a mixing glass. Okay. All right. Can I use my shaker? Is that fine? You totally can. You can use the big side of your uh, shaker tin if you want to do that as well. Okay. Okay. We do need a bar spoon for this. this. This cocktail does not have any citrus. We don't have citrus. That's generally when we want to stir. So if you don't have a swizzle bar spoon, Having a regular spoon at home is fine too. I'll show you how to stir with that. Um, it is more of like a soup spoon, soup spoon stir uh, than it is a, a classic swizzle stir, but it works just the same, okay? We wanna make sure we have our glassware, which we want a martini or a coupe, or in this case, I have a Nick and Nora. We need a strainer to strain out from our yare. All right. A measuring tool, okay? So you need, any kind of measuring tool that has a one ounce or two ounce measurement to it. Gotcha. Excellent. Obviously you need your ice. Check. Orange. You have your orange? Yes. Yes, excellent. And then a paring knife. If you have a peeler, great. But a paring knife can work as well because we're actually gonna take the rind off of this and do some garnish work in a second as well, okay? okay. All right, so let's get started with our ingredients and our ingredient lists here. So you're using wood for reserve bourbon, right, Lamar? I am, yes. Heard that. I am using Angel's Envy this evening. Um, I love Angel's Envy as well. Um, it's a little pricey, not gonna lie, for like making your cocktails on, um, but it is finished in port barrel, um, so it has a little bit of a Venice quality to it. Um, beautiful stuff, also through the month of September, they are doing a promotion called Toast the Trees. So you just take a picture of your angel and they'll plant an oak tree, which is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. awesome. Yeah, so we're gonna go ahead and do two ounces here right. of our bourbon. And I'm just putting this in my mixer, correct? Yes, you are. Do not put ice in your mixer. We do not want to over dilute our cocktail because ice is a drink. All right. 
Okay. Bourbons in my mixer, two ounces. And then, now, we're gonna take our apricot or our peach liqueur, and we're gonna do 0.75 ounces. All righty. Right in. Again, I'm gonna part a little bit of sweetness. I'd like to say that was sweet enough, but. <laughs> now, what is the difference between using the peach and the apricot? Is there any difference in the taste of the cocktail? Um, slightly, right? So we're using the apricot to add a little bit more mouthfeel to the cocktail, um, as well as imparting a little bit of that quote unquote sweetness. When we're using processed flavors in this way, um, the real difference that you're gonna get is that the peach is gonna actually come off more as a ripe flavor, where your apricot liqueur generally comes off as more of a toasty, bready characteristic. Okay, got it. Cool. Alrighty, so I have my bourbon and I have my peach in my mixer. Indeed. All right. So then we have our Averna Amaro, 0.75. Now, I know that you have the Amaro Montenegro. Yes, that's correct. And for the most part, that um, Amaro is a perfect one for one switch. A classic black Manhattan calls for Averna, okay? Um, and that is because of the flavor profile um, and the way that it works with bourbon. However, Amaro Montenegro being um, a little bit more uh, characteristic on the side of rosemary and herbal and vegetable qualities, you might actually get a nice little pungency and a nice little potency coming from using different Amaros. So if you want to have fun doing and trying this cocktail with a different style of Amaro, feel free because there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of Amaros out there. You just want to be careful um, with the mixes because uh, everyone has a different uh, mix of herbs that they use. Gotcha. Okay. Oh. Excellent. So that's a 0.75 into your mix. That's it. Got it. Excellent. Now, Angostura bitters, two dashes, just right into your mix. All right. Two dashes in the mix. Yeah, so we have a little bit more of that Caribbean feel, a little bit of spice to our cocktail. We are also going to put two dashes of orange juice into that as well. All right. We're going to kick it up a notch. You want to pull your orange bitters out there and part not necessarily a bitter quality, but more of a fruit as Okay. All right. So now we are ready for stir. So you grab your glass. So I'm stirring at this point? Yep. We're going to add ice to our vessel. All right. Okay. Now, if we are using a bar spoon, a traditional swizzle bar spoon, you're going to take your pointer finger and your middle finger and apply the inside of it to the back of the spoon. So on a rounded all right, I'm still putting ice in my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. you take your ring finger and your pinky finger and put it on the inside. Okay. okay. All right, so you're going to hold it like a pencil, but adding that extra finger being your middle finger, okay? Okay. Now, the back of your spoon, the rounded part, make sure that that touches the inside of your mixing vessel and get behind a good set of ice there. Yeah. All right. Now, all you're gonna do, we're not gonna go around like we're stirring a stew, right? We want that ice, we want the swizzle to actually do the work for us. So just push back with your middle finger and push forward with your ring finger. And it'll start moving on its own. Okay? Now, uh, and and is my cocktail supposed to be in with the ice already or not yet? Yeah, your, your cocktail and your ice. Okay. <laughs> I'm still in the mixing the cup. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you can build right into your mixing glass. Then. All right. Now, now we're in the glass. Okay. There you go. Yeah, we're not going we're, we're gonna to pour it into our martini or coupe glass in a second. All right. You want about 30 to 35 rotations. Um, again, with any cocktail, we want to make sure that we are imparting ice into every single speck. So you want about 0.3 to 0.5 ounces of dilution. We don't want to break up the flavors of our bourbon and our Amaro, right? We still want to taste them. We don't want to break it. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and let's strain our 
cocktail right into our glass. Perfect. Straight down the middle. Beautiful. Okay. Now we're going to set our cocktail aside. Okay. Not going to touch it. I know we're, we're itching to get that drink in, but we're not going to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we can take our peeler or our paring knife, whichever one you have in front of you. Take your orange, okay? And we are going to get a really nice big segment off of this orange, okay? Um, am I only doing the peel or am I doing a piece of the orange as well? You do not want a piece of the orange. Okay, no orange. <laughs> oh, no. We just want the, the, the rind, okay? All right. Excellent. So, Lamar and viewers at home, I want you to put out your hand and I want you to put that rind in between your uh, pointer finger and your middle finger, and you okay. squeeze that onto your hand. This okay. way. All right. How did you feel the juice come out? Yes, there was yes. some juice coming out. That is natural essences. When you see us bartender do that with your cocktails, we're not doing it for show. We're actually doing it for a reason. Okay. okay. Pull your cocktail back and give your cocktail a nose. All right. Smells good. Right? It's gonna smell better now. Let's take our rinds, okay? Make sure that the outside is facing our cocktail, because if we squeeze that and it flips the other way, we're gonna get that on our fingers, and that's not what we want. Okay. So pointer finger, middle finger on the top, your thumbs on the bottom, face down, push over and across your drink. And you should see that zest show up on top of your drink there, right? Right. Wipe your glass with your twist. Okay. Excellent. And now we're going to just give it a nice little twist over there and pop that right in. Okay? All right. Now smell your drink. I can smell the orange really okay. coming through, which I love. Yeah. So we've now given the cocktail another dimension. Right, but it's an aromatic dimension, and we'll see how that impacts us off the flavor as well. Here, everyone, to the National Black MBA Association, to our to our first cocktail of the day. All right. Now, am I done now? Can I can I taste it? Yeah, we just cheers. Oh yes. I didn't hear you that well, so sorry. Ah. <laughs> I'm like, when am I going to get to drink and taste this drink? That is awesome. I do taste the peach coming through really strong, and I do taste a little bit of the orange as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, on the Amara, are you getting a little bit of bitter? I am getting a little bit of the bitter, yeah. Very nice. Try not to drink too much, because I still have an entire program left. Oh. <laughs> and I'm sure they don't want me to do this program when I've had this awesome drink, which is a little bit strong. Um, but thank you so much, AJ. We really appreciate it. It's awesome that you are out in the community uh, giving back of your talent. It's amazing that you're a female mixologist, a black mixologist, and that you're an entrepreneur. So we really want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and I hope those at home mix along uh, and they're going to enjoy their cocktail for the rest of the program because I can't enjoy mine just yet. But as soon as this is done, I will be having my cocktail. AJ, thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. Thank you, Lamar. Appreciate it.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you enjoy your cocktail. I'm still gonna hang on to mine right here, but I do wanna bring up our next guest. And that next guest is a local celebrity in his own right. Not only is he a personal cuisine curator and a food and nutrition educator, but he's also the co-founder of one of my favorite restaurants and a very popular restaurant in the DMV area called Kitchen Cray. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Jojo. What's going on? How are you doing? Chef Jojo, welcome. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to have you here. I was telling everyone I love Kitchen Cray um, and I've heard so much about you and the personal education that you've been doing. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll get started on this evening's dish soon, but tell us, Chef, how did you get started in the culinary field? It's a great question. Well, um, once I graduated college, uh, I have a uh, bachelor's in graphic design, and I thought that I would be like the best graphic designer in the world, but um, God had a different plan for me, and uh, I, my attention turned to cooking, and uh, in 2012, uh, I was able to connect with uh, Chef J.R. Robinson, who's my my mentor and the founder of Kitchen Cray, and he trained me, and uh, eight years later, here I am. Wonderful. Now, Chef, when I think of healthy eating, which I know you're a big proponent of, I always think of bland food, and I also think of expensive food. Why did you decide to become an educator on healthy eating? Because of what you just said, the misconception that healthy food has to be either expensive or bland. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, shown that uh, when it comes to healthy food, just using fresh ingredients, simple fresh ingredients can enhance the food that you're eating uh, way more than any type of seasoning that um, you might have in your in your in, in your cabinet. So, uh, fresh ingredients is definitely the key. Cool. And I know we're gonna do a healthy, delicious dish this evening. But in general, how can we make healthier choices while still making it tasty and exciting? Well, definitely um, using less salt. Um, African Americans in general, uh, we have a high risk of high blood pressure and diabetes. So um, I'm not going to be using any added salt for today's recipe, but in general, using fresh herbs uh, like cilantro or parsley or thyme, oregano, like those uh, herbs can enhance the flavor of your foods. And also citrus, so lemon, lime, orange. We'll be using a little bit of orange today. Uh, or, and uh, also vinegar, like those components can definitely enhance the flavor of food without adding the extra salts and processed uh, seasonings. All right, wonderful. So this evening we're gonna be doing Chef Jojo famous Asian salad with a soy ginger vinaigrette. Um, tell us about your inspiration for this dish and then we can go ahead and get started. I have all my ingredients here ready to go. Well, um, so the inspiration to this recipe, uh, I also work with a young lady uh, in uh, D.C. called Charmaine Jones and her company, Food Jonesy. We do a lot of um, healthy cooking classes and also nutrition education uh, for folks in D.C. that are suffer suffering from chronic uh, illnesses. And this is one of the recipes that uh, we had uh, introduced to those, um, those uh, patients. So this is definitely one of the favorites, and I felt that this was the perfect uh, recipe to do for today's event. All right, wonderful. Well, Chef, over to you. I'm ready to cook and create my salad. Okay. Uh, guide me along. Sounds good. Well, uh, in my bowl, so far I have all of the uh, vegetables for our salad. As you see, we have our sliced peppers. We have our baby corn. We also have edamame. Edamame is a uh, soybean, a really great source of protein. So for those that uh, don't eat meat, uh, if they're vegan, uh, using edamame is a great uh, uh, protein option for you. We also have um, purple cabbage, uh, white cabbage. We have uh, cilantro. And so I, as you see, I already pre-cut all of my ingredients. Okay. Uh, scallions, carrots. I also added some fresh uh, chopped garlic and also uh, some uh, chopped ginger. So I'm just going to mix up all of my uh, vegetables right now in the bowl. I'm just dumping all of mine in here. Yeah, the, the all your vegetables together. And as you see, like all of the colors, are, you know, like all the colors are coming together. Like it, it like automatically it looks appealing to the eye. And you know, you're definitely gonna you're definitely gonna see how uh, light and refreshing it is too once we mix everything together. Okay. 
Yeah, so once you give that a mix, just take a look at the colors. Just marvel the uh, the appearance first. And then you're also going to uh, get to smell all the aromas, the, uh, the onions, the cilantro, the peppers. Yes, that's definitely coming through. Now, also, just a quick health tip. Health tip. So if anybody decides to make this recipe, and if you buy the canned uh, edamame or the canned baby corn, which is a part of the uh, recipe as well, Always rinse it off once you uh, take it from the can. Okay. Rinse all the, rinse all the excess salt out. Okay. Got it. All right. So all of my ingredients are in the bowl now. Okay. And I have my all of my ingredients together too. All right. So for the dressing, I have another bowl, and as you see, I already have some chopped garlic and ginger right here. So I'm just gonna add for our dressing some low sodium. Soy sauce. So with the ginger, I decided to use a ginger powder. How much of that do I put in here? Uh, how much uh, veggies are you making? You I'll show you. I have a pretty big bowl here. I don't know if you can see it of my veggies. Add about, add about a tablespoon in. Mix it up. All right. Ginger, um, ginger really like sets that flavor too. So I would say taste it. That tablespoon, taste it if you feel like you need more. Oh, you could open that more. The thing about ginger is that it can never hurt the dish. Um, you know, it's not salty, you know, it's not sweet, you know, it has like that strong, um, that strong flavor. But with the amount that you're making, a tablespoon should be fine. Okay, great. So I have my, my uh, garlic and my ginger in here. What else do I add to this? To so, make uh, no sodium soy sauce. Okay. All right. Well, that's a quarter cup, correct? Yes, sir. All right. So I just added that in. And I'm eyeballing, so you could uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, measure. I'm just going to do what I do. <laughs> I have mine measured out. <laughs> I have my, I also have some uh, some sesame oil. I'm going to add that to the bowl. Add that. All right. And also olive oil. Okay. Can I stir it while I'm doing it? Cause it yeah, definitely stir. All right. And I'm gonna be using agave, but you can use either honey, agave, or brown sugar as a uh, sweetener. Gotcha, and I have honey. Sounds good. All right, so I'm gonna dump my honey in here. And let, me, let me also say this. If you still have a slice of your orange from the previous um, presenter, shout out to AJ, that drink is phenomenal. It definitely hits you up and uh, definitely trying to uh, taste, taste that creation you uh, just made. All right. If you, have, if you still have an orange, like, you can uh, squeeze that in too. This flavor really sticky. Uh, now, I actually pre squeeze some lemon juice. That should be okay, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So I'm going to put that in here as well. Yep. And grab a whisk, and we're just going to whisk our dressing together. All right, let me get the whisk. I'm going to try my best to bring my bowl up so I can see what I'm doing. All right. <laughs> now, what is the consistency of the dressing supposed to be like? Um, almost, you know, like a like a vinaigrette. So slightly you know, on the earlier side, slightly on the uh, thinner side. Okay, got it. And definitely, uh, you know, taste that. You make. Grab my now, I actually want to taste this. I know that if my mom was watching, she would squirm because she doesn't like. I'm from Barbados, and you're not supposed to taste the food. But oh, really? I'm gonna go ahead and taste it. All right. <laughs> And if you if you taste yours and if it's a little on the oilier side, um, feel free to add some more lemon to it. Got it. All right. That'll help to cut the uh, thickness of the oil. That'll that city definitely. Gotcha. All right. All right. Let me ask you a question. Sure. How often do you cook? What are some of your uh, famous dishes? So you got the apron. <laughs> um. If any of my family is watching, they'll probably laugh and say I don't cook, that my stove doesn't get much usage. Uh -huh. um, but I do cook at least once a week. Um, and my mom cooks all the rest of the time. 
That's good. Yeah. Um, another quick tip for those that like spicy, uh, definitely use chili flakes. Okay. Yeah, that'll uh, give it like a nice kick to it. Gotcha. All right. All right. So I think I'm done mixing here. Sounds good. So now we can take our dressing. And I'm going to bring my bowls up so everybody can kind of see what's going on. So we're going to add our dressing slowly to the bowl with all of our vegetables. All right. All right. And just give it a mix. Mix up all the ingredients. And then we're going to set that to the side. All right. So I added that. And just give it a mix. Yep. And I think you're going to go on and do something additional. I decided to stop at the vegetarian type option, which is no problem. <laughs> just a salad. No problem. But take it away. Feel free to take it away. So for those of you on um, on, the, on this virtual call, for those that love shrimp, this is for you. All right. So bring my uh, burner over. Let me tilt down my laptop for you. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. All right. Cool. So I have my uh my coffee. And the first thing is hot. Okay. All right. On my stove is I'm gonna show you my shrimp. Okay. So shrimp seasoned with uh, fresh ginger, garlic, cilantro, spring onions. Chili flakes and a little bit of sesame oil. Got it. So I didn't add any salt to the This podium meal to be in our dressing. Okay. So I'm going to add some olive oil. All right. All right. Now, was I supposed to add in my wonton strips already? Because I don't have them in there yet. We're going to add that later. We don't want them okay. to get soggy. Got it. Okay. All right. Good, 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 good pickup though, because we, we didn't touch on it yet. <laughs> yeah, the wontons are going to sort of be like a, uh, going to sort of be like the topping. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to add my shrimp. Okay. And while you do that, I'm going to grab a fork so I can actually taste it. Okay. All right. And, uh, for those that maybe have shellfish or seafood allergies, can you do this with any other types of, of uh, protein? Absolutely. You can do chicken, you can do steak, you can do uh, one of my favorite salmon, you can do your favorite type of fish. Okay. You, know, creative, you can also do crab. I mean, the, you know what? The beautiful thing about protein is that you should be allowed to experiment. You should be allowed to... You know, Figure out what you like. You know what I mean? Right. I like to create my own rules in the kitchen. Got I it. just want to do it in a healthy way. So feel free. To, so let's do it again. Feel free to use your food protein. The Eddie Mommy is a great protein. So if you are vegan or animal products, the salad is perfect. Got it. All right. Now, while you're doing that, chef. What distinguishes you from other chefs in the DMV and nationally or even worldwide? Well, um, it's a great question because I've only been cooking for eight years now, so I'm still like learning myself. But the big, the, I would say the biggest thing for me is for those that are interested in cooking or, in, or for those that's interested in this career field, for whatever reason, if you can't go to culinary school, don't be discouraged because I didn't go. And God's opened doors for me that I've never thought I'd see. So uh, I would say just either, you know, start off working at a restaurant and kind of build your way up and gain your experience that way. Or uh, work with a mentor. I was blessed enough to do both. I was okay. able to start up at a restaurant and to connect with the mentor who was able to train me and to build me up to who I am today. And also my overall passion. So you have to be passionate about this uh about this industry. You have to be passionate and you also have to realize that it's bigger than you. You know, like when it comes to food, it's essential. Everybody needs it. So your personal problems have to go out the door. And, you know, the only thing that matters between like you and cooking is you and that food. And, you know, you can change somebody's life with that. So. Got it. 
And one of the things you mentioned, which is big for us in the National Black NBA Association, is having mentors. So I'm glad that you definitely pointed that out. Absolutely. Right. So right now I'm just turning my shrimp over. Okay. And um, you know they're done when they start turning pink, right? Okay. So I'm turning these guys over. And like I said, cooking is about being, being experimental, you know, trying new things. So I didn't add any extra shrimp. However, I'm going to add some citrus to it to give it more flavor. Okay. All right. And this is just a little trick to show you know, anybody that wants to make this home. Now, is there anything different that we would do if we were cooking the, let's say, chicken? Um, not really. I mean, I guess, I guess just cook the chicken breast the same way you know, and then just slice it up and put it in strips. Got it. Okay. Or if you're cooking for them and you can make it, you know, whatever you want. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Right. The reason why I chose to do shrimp is that you know, it doesn't take too long to cook, and we're done. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. All right, so I'm gonna turn my paper off and put my pan down. <laughs> We're gonna plate up. All right. All right, grab myself a clean bowl, a clean white bowl for those that can make it best, for those that can kind of stand out. So we're gonna add our salad. Okay. Look at all the colors. Let me push this gold back. The all over here. Wonderful. And and I'm you, you let me know when I need to add these wontons because I'm sitting here. Still yeah, here. You, you've been asking about those wontons. <laughs> all right. Go ahead and get your wontons on there. All right. It's I like wontons. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. Uh, right. So now I'm going to add my shrimp. We're going to add the shrimp on top. Okay. Right. And for those that you know are um, big on meal prep, you know, trying to uh, maintain that healthy lifestyle, something like this is like the perfect dish. And then we're gonna add our wontons on top. For the All right, my favorite part. And I'm just adding mine to the bowl. All right, here we go. All right. I'm just gonna push my laptop up so y'all can see my feet. Gotcha. Here we go. Uh, go ahead and taste it. Are you tasting yours? Oh yeah, let me taste mine. <laughs> I used to cook it for, for other people. Like I'm not used to tasting my own stuff. You know. All right, let's see what we got going on over here. I can definitely taste the ginger coming through. Okay. That's amazing. And it's good. You can squeeze some extra uh, lemon on it. That extra citrus would also help that help up the flavors come together even better. But yeah, we're good. that was amazing, and it definitely tastes healthy. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's a tasty, healthy food. That's the, the the amazing thing about it. Right. And chef, before we wrap up the session, and um having bad manners and I'm eating while speaking, but I'll continue. Uh, tell us more about pre-COVID-19 Chef Jojo versus Chef Jojo today, and what can we expect to see from you in the future? Well, I'm gonna be very transparent with you. Pre-COVID Jojo was at a comfortable place. You know, I was used to routine. And uh, I was still living in my purpose, but sometimes, you know, God puts you in multiple situations to get your full potential to take you to new levels, right? So when COVID hit, you know, it just kind of put me in a space. You know, I wasn't seeing friends, people that I would really, you know, people who I was affiliated with and seeing more of a But I was able to be with my family and I was able to have some time by myself to try to figure out gotcha. you know, like what's next. And Right now, like I'm just getting used to this whole virtual thing. Like I love being on the camera. I feel like I have the charisma, but you know, it's it's, it's also something to to you have, you have to adapt to uh, you know the whole virtual world. Um, so getting used to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, working on you know a lot of small goals. I'll be out soon. 
uh, cook. Okay. Yeah, got it. Got lined up. So we got a lot coming from Chef Jojo. Yeah. Now I'm going to be selfish and I want to have another bite of my salad. So I'm going to ask you one more question before I let you go while I take another bite. Sure. Tell us a little bit about your affiliation. So I know that uh, you were one of the co-founders of uh, Kitchen Prey. You're also affiliated with uh, Martha's Table, uh, Zion Church. Tell us more about those. Yeah. So um, like I said, uh, I was just put. I was just put. Just put in a great spot at the perfect time. You know, working with Chef Jr. and being a part, a part of that. You know, during its early beginning. You know. Like when we started, when we first started, we started the chef and uh, catering company, and uh, we were able to open up, uh, you know, the first restaurant uh, in two years in Atlanta, Maryland, and we have a second location opening up uh, off of East Street uh, very soon in, in the next couple of weeks. So we have that. In addition to that, I was also uh, one of the uh, food educators at Martha's Table, mm -hmm. uh, which is a uh, well-respected nonprofit in uh, DC, and that. Really, how like my passion for healthy uh, eating, healthy cooking began. Uh, so, shout out to Martha Sable, shout out to Kitchen Cray, and also shout out to uh, Zion Church. Um, I'm the uh, chef for the pastors and okay. Pastor Keith Battle. So, uh, I get to cook for the pastors recently. So, can't wait to COVID to end. Okay, you know, cook for them again. I'm not gonna definitely missing my food. <laughs> cool, wonderful. Well, Chef Jojo, it has been a pleasure having you again. Um, you're an inspiration to all of us here in the DMV area. Thank you for everything you do. It sounds like you have some big things coming. Yeah. So definitely want to hear more as all of these successes unfold for you. Um, again, thank you so much. And before uh, we bring on our next guest, we want to welcome up the president of the Chicago chapter, who's going to tell you a little bit about what's in store for conference 2021. Thank you, Chef Jojo. Thank you. God bless. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I hope you are enjoying this year's virtual conference experience with the National Black MBA Association. My name is Amelia Jackson. I am the current chapter president for the Chicago chapter, and we are excited to have you join us on next year, 2021, as we bring in 51 years of the National Black Association being in existence. We're gonna start the 51 off in Chicago. We are excited to have you there. We're, we have so much in store for you. So mark your calendars for September, do you hear me? September 14th through the 18th of 2021. September 14th through the 18th of 2021. All right. I'm excited. My board is excited. Actually, I will be immediate past president at that time. We will have uh, current president-elect Stacey Crook will be at the helm of that particular transition. She's going to welcome you into Chicago and the board there, her administration with open arms. So we will be able to enjoy the sights and sounds of Chicago, the food. Trust me, Chicago is the second city. We are the best and the finest. No offense to any of the chapters, but we know how to do it right, especially since we're bringing it home. The National Black NBA Association 50 years ago was founded right here in the city of Chicago at the University of Chicago. Then it was not Booth, it was Graduate School of Business, but now it's Booth and we are 50 years strong and we're 39 chapters in. So we are excited that you will be joining us. Now, 
this can be an interaction, uh, interactive session. So if people can help me in the chat, I'm gonna see if I can get to you on Facebook. If you have any questions for me, let me know. I definitely want to interact with you as we prepare for the next exciting event and activity that we have on this particular platform. So thank you again. I'm Amelia from Chicago. So let me know if you have any questions. I'm looking at Facebook at the same time. So <laughs> just making sure I want to interact with you. You may hear an echo in the background. I'm going to turn my phone down. It's so funny to see myself on the computer screen and on Facebook at the same time. This is so weird, but that's okay. Any questions for me? If not, oh, Lamar just came in. Hi, Lamar. Hey, hey, Amelia, we are so excited to come yeah. to Chicago next year. Um, I'm so elated to hear everything that you have in store for us. Uh, it's going to be an amazing experience. Yes, 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 yes. I it do see a question pop up. We did have a question from Ms. Linda Jordan, my favorite Atlanta person. Question, if COVID is still around, is there a plan B? Of course there is. We're going to have another virtual experience and we're going to bring it to you like you've never seen before because, you know, we are Chicago. That's how we do. Thank you, Linda, for your question all the way out from Atlanta. Thanks, Linda. Ms. Erica Roberts, all right, out from Maryland. Hi, Amelia, thanks for all of your planning and leadership for this historical conference. You are welcome, We it, it, and it's not just me, it takes a team, trust me, to plan a conference is huge, whether it's in person or virtual, it takes a lot of planning. And we are happy to do what we can to uh, promote black excellence. We are the talented tip. I'm going to still uh, uh, shout that from the mountaintops, we do things and the black billionaires are right here in the National Black MBA Association. Proactive Michelle, I like that. How long have yeah. you been a member of National Black MBA Association? Well, um, Lamar, I'll let you speak to that. For me, I've been a member since 2006. I have been an active member since 2006. I served on the marketing communications committee um, here in Chicago and then kind of worked my way up from 2007 to now on the board for the Chicago. So I've been uh, uh, around for a, a long time. Lamar, what about you? I've been a member since 2016. So I'm one of the newer folks in the, the association. He's new, but he has been chapter president. So anybody knows who wears the chapter president's hat. <laughs> you get some, you get a couple of gray hairs. <laughs> well, Amelia, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Again, we are really looking forward to coming to Chicago next year. We hope COVID doesn't spoil this plan. Um, and we look forward to you and your incoming president uh, welcoming us to Chicago. Thank you so much. And I'll chat with you soon. Uh, so up next, uh, in case you don't, did you really like a uh, couple that you mentioned earlier, although that one was amazing, we have a master sommelier who is going to come on and tell us more about season one. So with that, let's bring up that day tomorrow. Jade, welcome. It is Hi, so awesome to see you. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Now, tell me, Jade, how did you get into this? Because for me, I, I'm sipping on a red wine. When I sip on reds, they all taste the same, except that some are a little bit drier than others. How did you pick up uh, uh, you know, this incredible talent of helping people discover wines that they love? Sure. Uh, first, I just want to cheers you guys. Happy 50th. This is sure. major. major. Thank Happy you for having me be a part of this, for sure. Um, so I really got into wine um, because I've just always been taken by flavor. Um, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy mixing cocktails. I bartended for a really long time. Um, 
I like tea. I like coffee. It just so happens that within wine, there are various pathways that you can get certified in. Um, so throughout my working career, I've hit a lot of stops. I've hit a lot of gates. Um, and I'm the kind of person that doesn't do very well with hearing no. Um, so, you know, I really uh, was fortunate enough to get into bartending at a young age. So I had a lot of liquidity. Um, that is to say funds to put myself through an educational path um, in wine. It tends to be expensive. So I'm very blessed to have had that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and I was really just on this quest. Like, you mean to tell me you don't think I can do this? Let me show you how well I can. Um, so I really made my way up, um, by way of certifications and just with a, a, a naturally, um, developed palette. Wonderful. Well, that I, just is say, I just want to say, um, a palette isn't something that you necessarily can't develop. Um, anybody who is interested in exploring the science of flavor and spice, I absolutely encourage you, uh, to go ahead. Even if you don't think you have a palette, it might just be that we need to work on the vocabulary a little bit. Well, that's great because again, all reds taste the same to me, um, but I definitely would like a more sophisticated and developed palette um, for when I'm out dining with uh, colleagues. So uh, I'll definitely heed that advice. Um, well, let's get right into it and start with our first region. I know this evening you're gonna be exploring wines in different regions. Which region do you have up for us first and what wines are we gonna be looking at? So first I just wanna say that, you know, um, it, Wine is really a matter of preference. So I'm going to be talking a lot, um, speaking a lot and making um, a lot of recommendations. None of this is set in stone. At the end of the day, I think the most important thing is that people enjoy themselves and um, gravitate towards what really um, tastes good to them. So forgive me if I sound very black and white in the way that I present information. Um, it really is all up to be molded um, and is really up to the person that uh, has the glass in front of them. So that being said, I'm going to kind of dive into um, what's going to seem like a bunch of rules. They're not. Rules are just there to be challenged um, and to give you a kind of guideline into how to approach this or enter a world that may seem a little um, unapproachable at the moment. Um, That's a great foundation for us. Yes, yes. So the the first um, the first thing is we're going to be talking about food and wine pairing. Um, so oftentimes when I'm looking to pair uh, wine with my food, I look to Europe. Um, that's just because if we're talking about you know. Um, let's just say we're not talking about wine anymore. Let's say that we're talking about fruit. I know that if I have an orange and it's grown in a cooler climate, as opposed to a climate that's a little bit warmer and has more um, exposure to the sun, that fruit is going to be a little bit more tart. It's gonna have a little bit more tension. It's gonna be a little bit more acidic than it is um, sweet. Um, that's what we're looking for in a wine to stand up to food. Um, when I drink wine, uh, namely with food and not just by itself, I treat wine as if it's a condiment. I almost treat it as if it's a gravy. Um, so I'm really looking for the wine to stand up to the food, not to overshadow it, not to get lost. So really skating on that balance. Okay. The first uh, region that we'll go to is um, Spain. All right. Um, I'm really talking about wines, um, again, as they um, appeal to, to food. And I happen to be... Um, uh, passionate about the food of the diaspora. So when I think of food, I'm thinking of food from the Caribbean. I'm thinking of food from the American South. I'm thinking of food from Eastern and Western Africa. So you're going to hear a lot of um, mention to specific spices and specific sauces. Um, so when I'm in Spain, I'm really drawn to the oxidized wines of Jerez. Uh, when I say oxidized, I mean to say that the wine has seen a whole lot of oxygen. Um, there are many ways that you can do this. It's a producer's choice. But what happens when you get a whole bunch of oxygen going on in your wine, you get a lot of these nutty or um, seed-like flavors and textures. So if I'm thinking of my wine as a sauce, um, what kind of sauces do am I familiar with that have the same nutty or seedy kind of uh, flavor in them, the same way that AJ's apricot liqueur brought up the um, stone fruit and the apricot notes of the bourbon. I'm looking for my oxidized wine to kind of bring out the nuttiness or the seediness of a sauce. Um, so I go for yellow curries. Okay. Um, whenever I have a yellow curry on my plate, I 
ask uh, the wine professional close to me, whether it be a sommelier, whether it be my server, or whether it be um, a liquor store or a wine store attendant, you know, what do you have that's oxidized? I happen to know that Jerez has a lot of oxidized wines. That's not to say that this is the only place that you can find them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do find that you're asking for an oxidized Spanish wine and it's something that speaks to you, you can find these sorts of wines in different um, regions. And I think that's a really good place to kind of start. Okay. Another recommendation that I make uh, coming out of um, Spain is a rosé from Rioja. That's a rosado um, made from the Tempranillo grape. Um, I love these rosés because they don't have that really round, jammy, berry kind of quality that we think of when we think of rosés. This is more of a savory rosé. It has okay. a lot of herbal qualities going on. Um, and to me, when I think of Spain, I think of a lot of jamón. I think of a lot of pork mm -hmm. and fattier cuts. Yeah. So any time that you have a kind of fattier component in your food, I think that a really nice savory rosé complements that. Um, it's able to cut through um, whatever meat there is, whatever protein there is that's adding that kind of melty um, lard, so to speak, and it's able to handle it without adding too much of its own, um, like a blanket of flavor that's going to just wipe everything out. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm guilty of drinking rosé with, any and everything. So, <laughs> but it's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. It's I great to know that here as well. Then. I have a rosé in front of me right now. Um, and I actually think this is a really good time to go over proper tasting technique. You mentioned that a lot of wines taste the same to you. And that might be because we're not filtering them through our olfactory. Um, it really is scientific. You have this, this thing in the back of your palate. It's what connects your nose to your throat. It's why you hold your nose as a kid when you take um, cough medicine. It's why you're encouraged to not really breathe if you're taking a shot of some really rough liquor. Um, the more that you breathe in, the more that you're smelling while you're tasting, the more of these subtle tastes will come through, the more the nuances will really open up. Um, we call that aromatizing, right? So when you see people going like this, it's not just to look fancy, it's literally breaking these molecular bonds that are hiding some of the flavors, some of the um, qualities of the wine. Okay. So our first point of air is actually in the glass. Got it, okay. After- like a Swirl. Yeah, just a quick little swirl. If you swirl it too much, you might let everything escape. You wanna save <laughs> it for yourself, you know? All right. So the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna get your nose in the glass. Um, I was mentioning the olfactory, the way that you kind of get the flavors going on in there is you breathe a little bit through your nose and a little bit through your mouth okay. at the same time. Gotcha. So when I do this, I'm really not so much trying to figure out what's in the glass, but more so what the quality is. For example, um, in a red wine or in a rosé, I always tend to find some type of cherry. So to me, I just want to define the cherry. Is it a really pale red cherry that maybe needs a little bit more time on the tree in order to get the flavors going? Is it a really round, ripe red cherry that has a lot of um, fruit and sweetness going on? Are we getting into a black cherry, meaning that the cherry is getting a little bit darker? I think most of us have this experience with various fruits where an apple is an apple, but it can go from green to yellow to red. And we all are kind of familiar with what that's going to do. It's the same thing with wine. They're just grapes. Yeah. So how ripe was this grape? Um, how long was it on the vine, allowing it to really develop this complexity of flavor? So that's really what we're figuring out once it goes to the olfactory. Okay. And once we smell it a little bit, when we take the sip, you want to do that thing where it kind of sounds like you're slurping and it may not always be appropriate, but if you are feeling comfortable, it really does help with allowing all of the flavors to express themselves properly on your palate. Okay. All right. So that should have allowed your wine to open up a little bit. Yes. I think you really experience it. I don't think I've ever tried to experience a red wine like that, but I definitely got some different notes coming through for this wine that I'm drinking. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. And if anybody has any questions that's watching right now, whether it be about how to taste wine, how to pair wine, or the specific regions that we're kind of glossing over, please feel free. And let's go to the next region. So we just touched on Spain. What yeah. other regions are you excited about? So I actually have a strong background um, in Italy. Italy. Okay. I've traveled around Italy quite a bit. Um, and 
it's just such a compelling country because each region is so far different from the next, from the expression of their wines to their um, farming traditions, to even the type of pasta that they make. Um, so it's very easy for me to do this kind of um, jump from Italian food over to the foods of my upbringing and that I'm familiar with because there are so many different spice levels and so many different ways of layering your flavor. Um, throughout Italy. So that's kind of a, a comfort zone for me. Okay. I'm a big fan of sparkling wines from Emilia Romagna. All right. I'm drinking a Rosé Lambrusco right now, um, but they have sparkling white, sparkling red, um, sparkling pink, obviously, so it's in my glass. Um, the food here is typically fried. You have a lot of like fried zucchini. Um, this is where you're going to find a lot of like breadcrumbs sprinkled on top. So naturally my, my, um, pivot is to anything that's like a fritter. I think specifically of fish cakes or, a dumpling or of anything that kind of comes in front of you like that. So, um, that's another pairing suggestion is really have fun throughout Amelia. Almost all of their wines are sparkling, um, right. and they're really gentle on the pocket. So if you were to go into a well-known region, say like Champagne, or even going to get a Cava, they tend to be a little bit pricier because they're well-known. They have a brand behind them. Mm -hmm. A lot of the wines of Amelia tend to be um, lesser known, um, farmed in a smaller fashion. Um, and I try not to recommend specific brands because I think it takes some of the fun out of exploration right. um, and out of giving some some folks um, a shot and also some support. All right. Before you continue, I see a question pop up. What are some of your favorite wines from Kevin? I love sparkling wines. Um, something that I do is if I'm in doubt about um, my pairing, a sparkling wine just always seems to do the trick. Uh, um, anything with bubbles is going to act almost as a cleanser for your palate. So every time you go back and you drink, um, you know, taste a, a glass of wine along with your food, it's a completely different experience from bite to bite. Um, so that's always a really safe thing for me. They're also really fun. Um, I also think that bubbles encourage you to be joyful and to celebrate. It's just the connection that most of us have. Um, and we can all use a little bit more, you know, joy and celebration. Now it's so 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 um, crazy. I don't know if crazy is a word that you you're really uh, passionate about sparkling wines because every time I talk about sparkling wine, people tend to say that they're not real wines. What what do you have to say about that? Um, I think that's nonsense. <laughs> um, I love so sparkling wine, by the way. I, I, that's my favorite. So and there's so many different ways to get the wine to sparkle, which in turn make the wine taste a bit differently. Um, we have a huge movement of what's called petulant natural right now, or um, method ancestral. Everybody is really going back and um, getting really nostalgic about um, authenticity and the old way of doing things. This is one of the first ways of getting your wines to bubble. Um, it's a natural wine technique, so you're dealing most of the time with organic grapes. Um, it's also very similar to the way that kombucha is made. So you're getting some probiotics and some added health benefits in there. And I'm just, I'm crazy about pet nets. Um, if I have something celebratory and I really want to impress somebody, always going for the champagne. I mean, it's some of the most expensive and well-known and um, really admired wine in the world. And it's hard to get upset with a bottle of champagne. Got it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and, and I'll ask this next question. Um, well, I see a question pop up on the screen, so I'll ask this first. What cheese do you pair with your wines? So that's a really loaded question because like grapes, there are so many different types of cheese. Something that I like to do, um, if I have a red wine in front of me, typically you want to go for either a really, really firm cheese and really salty cheese, or you want to go for something really creamy. Um, something that I like to compare it to is like cream cheese and jelly or like cheesecake with a little bit of jam on top. Mm -hmm. So if you have a red wine that doesn't have too much structure, that is to say it's not too drying um, okay. or not too acidic, it goes really well with those creamier cheeses. If you have a red wine that's a little bit more stern, has more structure, more presence on the palate, oftentimes a harder cheese with some like uh, a saltier or more saline profile go really well together. Got it. And now uh, my question was, you seem to be really passionate about Italy, but when I hear of wines, I hear that some of the best wines come from uh, South America. so like your Argentina, Chile region. What do you have to say about that? I say, if that's what you like, 
then that is the best region for you. Um, it's really exciting when we're talking about, this is gonna sound horrible, climate change is not really exciting. What is really exciting is that we have some of these wine regions who have had really hot temperatures mm -hmm. for generations, that's just their climate. So as some of these regions throughout Europe are facing the warmest temperatures they ever have, and they're trying to figure out how to raise their grapes and how to achieve um, the flavor profile that they're most closely associated with, you have these regions like Chile and Argentina who are like, we've been dealing with this forever. Like we can give you canopy management, you know exactly how high an altitude to go in order to achieve a balance. So I think what we're seeing right now is kind of the rise of the underdog because they're more experienced with the environment that we're walking into. Got it. Yeah. Well, let's move on to uh, our next country or region. I think you have one more that you want to tell us about. Um, I'm actually, so my favorite region in Italy happens to be Emilia Romagna. Um, Emilia has all the sparkling wines, but I did not mention um, my other suggestion, which is Primitivo from Puglia. Okay. Primitivo is um, in the parent tree of Zinfandel. So if you like California Zinfandel, really big, bold, um, strong red wine. Primitivo is a little bit more restrained, has a little bit more finesse, and goes really great with beefy, beefy stews. Um, I go to oxtail, a really spicy oxtail stew. Um, Primitivo and Zinfandel both have this quality of being able to raisinate on the vine. So you get a little bit of sugar that's going on in the wine, and that really helps with managing heat. And I really love that you were um, telling us about pairings that go with food that we actually eat like on an everyday basis. because. When you say oxtails and fish cakes and stuff like that and, and curries, that really resonates with me. So really appreciate that. Um, yeah, over to you to go uh, to our next country or, or region that you wanted to chat about. Sure, so next up we have France. Yeah. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with France. I think yeah. that most people regard it as the go-to region. Um, a lot of wine professionals choose to reference France. Um, and I think that it's a little short-sighted. I think that anywhere that grapes grow have their own language, have their own tradition, and it should be honored. We shouldn't always be pointing to one country. Right. Um, that being said, it's a really well-known place. So if you're struggling to find a point or if you're struggling to find a comparison, getting to know your French wine does really make it easier to kind of navigate the language um, throughout the wine world. As it stands now, we're working on that. We have a lot of education in place to kind of try to carry this conversation and move it forward. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so even with what Chef JJ was just cooking, it was a dish that had a lot of citrus. It had a lot of vinegar. Um, if you think about a lemon, or even if you think about a grapefruit or an orange biting into that, you have a physical reaction on your palate. You start to salivate. Mm -hmm. That's citrus. When you're looking at pairing something with citrus, you wanna be able to match that acidity. You wanna be able to match that intensity or else not only will the wine get lost, it could actually just start clashing, um, almost like toothpaste and orange juice. So that's something when you are dealing with a dish that has a lot of citrus, most of the time I say, you know, drink what you want. This is a time to be a little bit more discerning um, and just ask for something that has a little bit more acid in it so that you're not having this terrible, you know, physical reaction on your palate. Okay. So one of my go-to regions when I need something that's really crisp and acidic that doesn't have too much fat around it, that's to say would really overwhelm a simple and citrus driven dish like ceviche or like a salad with vinaigrette mm -hmm. um, is Chablis. Okay. Chablis is all the way in the north of Burgundy, France, and almost only grows Chardonnay. Um, so it's a really um malleable varietal it naturally has a lot of acidity and it will kind of mirror whatever uh dish you have in front of it got it and now can you dispel the the myth if it can be dispelled that cheaper wines or or less expensive wines i should say are not quality wines because I, I will tell you when i go into my uh, my wine store i'm looking for your 10 12 dollar and not my 50 up bottle of wine so there is a sweet spot um they say they say in my experience um it's about the 15 dollar mark that you okay. really start to see a difference 15 dollars and under um is when you see a lot of additives 
you see a lot of um, factory farming, which isn't always, you know, a negative thing. It's everything that goes into stretching these grapes out to meet that bottom line of being able to get it into the bottle for under $15. That's really um, the issue. When I say issue, this is where you start to get your headaches. This is where you start to get things that are not just grapes um, in your wines. And, it, and it's allowed. Um, in between the $15 to $30 mark is really where you find the best values. And in my opinion, once you start to get above $30, it needs a justification behind it. Um, namely, it's a vineyard site that they say gets the best sun or is within a direct wind stream or gets a lot of salinity imparted. Or um, when this happens, the justification is that these vineyard sites might be harder to farm. So they have to pay their farm workers more money in order to make it worth it for them to farm that area. Um, also maybe a brand association. Um, you know, oftentimes when you don't have the time or the interest to taste through 50 different producers, you want a brand that you know has a good reputation. They also, you know, can, can justify charging a little bit more money. But if you're in the market for something that is friendly, if you feel comfortable exploring a little bit, I'd say that the 15 to $30 price range is really your sweet spot. And before we take a couple more questions from our audience, if there are any, um, what does Jade drink like on a regular basis? What, 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 what can we find if we were to come into your residence? Um, I drink a lot of rum. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, through, through wine and through going um, to Italy a bunch and, and just traveling around to the different regions and seeing how much pride you know, Italians had in being Italian, but more so from being where they're from and their providence and what they do best and what could only grow in their backyard. Um, it really made me reflect on my experience in the Caribbean, my upbringing, you know, as a Jamaican and just the thought of the camaraderie that we have from island to island, you know, mm -hmm. Jamaicans and Bayesians can argue all day about who makes the best rum. I can <laughs> say that, <laughs> you know, and there's a reason for this. And, and, you know, just like we're talking about apples, just like we're talking about cherries, it's not fair to put everything in one category and just pinhole it into tasting the same. We all have nuance and the, the more that we respect each other's product, the better the conversation is. It's like music or poetry, who just wants one point of view or one track playing all the time. Um, so having that experience in Italy really emboldened me and gave me the confidence to speak to the products that my people make um, with the same kind of pride and with the same kind of insistence that, no, you're going to respect this as a rum that's from Jamaica, not as a rum that just can be thrown in this whole general Caribbean conversation because we have our own traditions and it just tastes different. Um, so that's been a really important part of not only my drinking experience, but my brand um, and what I'm doing within the wine and spirits world. Yeah. Okay. And I see a question pop up from Jeanette. Is there a vineyard that captivated you more in your travels? Yes. Um, so up in Piedmont, um, which is really known for their Nebbiolos, Barberas, you know, Barolo, Barbaresco. I fell in love once again with these sparkling wines. <laughs> um, these are a lot of wines that you don't see out of the country um, because the locals just consume it all. It's delicious. Um, but these vineyards that are way, way, way high up in altitude, really close to pine groves, um, they have the right amount of acidity and the right amount of piney nature to make lovely sparkling wines. Um, there's one producer. Uh, his name is Violti. He's in the town of um, uh, Aqui, and his vineyards just really took a piece of my heart. Got it. Um, another question. Which brand of Merlot would you recommend? I'm not going to recommend a specific brand, but I am going to recommend a region. Um, if you can find Merlot from Friuli in Italy, um, there's not that much of it made, so I can almost guarantee it's going to be delicious. What I really like about this region is, again, it has this kind of piney thing going on. There's a specific wind stream that carries through um, the, the southern part of Friuli that gets a lot of this pine green resiny thing going on, and it is beautiful in their Merlot. There's also this really faint kind of flinty smoky thing from the soils, and it's, it's an experience. Got it. And you have such a wealth of information. Like this is all going over my head as you mentioned all these different regions and 
uh, how does someone get into this field and become an expert like you? Um, again, I, I think it was that I had, um, I was already in the industry and mm -hmm. I was able to kind of float myself by working my two, three shifts a week. And there was a lot of study that went into this. Um, I happen to be a student of science. So the way that I go at wine is from a very scientific perspective. I have friends who are artists and who are writers that go at it from a very different um, you know, perspective than I do. But at the end of the day, it's time. It's a lot of time. A lot of time. Okay. And you said there are a lot of certifications that go into it as well, correct? Well, there are certifications if that's what you should choose. Um, but, you know, like you were mentioning in like Chef, uh, uh, <clears throat> Chef Jojo, Jojo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mentorship is so important. Um, yeah. And I think a big reason why I had to go the uh, certification route was because it was very hard for me to find a mentor. If you're mm -hmm. able to find somebody um, who is willing to share this knowledge with you, that's better than any certification. Um, in my Got opinion. It. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, it was amazing having you here today, Jade. I don't see any more questions. Um, I am really, really thrilled that you talked about sparkling wines today because that's my favorite. And again, I always hear that they're not real wines. I, I'm always told that you need to go with a red. Um, red is not my favorite. Um, I, I do drink it and I have them in my home, but it's not my favorite. I just love a sparkling wine. So I'm glad to hear you talk about that. And I'm really happy to hear that you talked about the wines that go with the foods that we eat in the African-American community. So our oxtails, our fish cakes, our curries, um, and all these different uh, foods that we prepare on a weekly basis. So thank you so much for your expertise, Jade. We really appreciate you having it on and cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, there you have it. Uh, our 2020 after conference experience. We heard from AJ who mixed up a really delicious cocktail for us, which I'm gonna go back and have immediately after this. Uh, we had Chef Jojo, who is again, one of our local celebrity chefs, uh, mixing up some healthy foods for us. So I hope you definitely get out there and try it. You saw I had to take some extra bites of it. It was absolutely delicious. And then we had the amazing expertise of Jade Marley uh, on our wine selection. So I hope you all had a great time this evening. We look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for day two of conference and the kickoff to the career fair. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that you all enjoy our 2020 conference and career fair of virtual experience. Have a good evening, everyone.